Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Hi everyone, my name is Julissa Kenyon and I am the Social Sciences Librarian here at the University of Idaho. Today, we're gonna talk about three simple tips for expanding your literature review. My colleague, Sunwen, is on uh, chat for Zoom. So if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat and there'll be time throughout my presentation today and definitely at the end where you can ask your questions. Everyone in person, same thing, raise your hand if you have any questions. So what we're gonna talk about today is conducting citation chaining, mining author networks, and then saving searches and setting search alerts. So those are those three tips to help you expand your lip review. Kind of ways to make all of the searching you've done a little bit easier because these are things that can help you expand the literature you're finding without having to start thinking about more keywords to try or different combinations. But at the end, we'll just talk about some strategies for planning and organizing a lit review recognizing that organization and plans for the lit review are very discipline specific. So I'll show you a few different options kind of depending on your discipline. But first, I just wanted to let you all know that the U of I library does have fellowships for graduate students. To access these and learn more about them, you can click the hyperlink within the slides, which are gonna be shared with you at the end of this session, or from our library homepage, if you click about, and then click on fellowships and look for the options that say graduate students. So we have fellowships uh, for students to work with our International Jazz Collection. Uh, our Center for Digital Inquiry and Learning has a fellowship in uh, collaboration with the College of Graduate Studies. And our newest fellowship is the Julie and David Levine Data Hub Fellowship. Uh, the Data Hub was discussed last week in our data management workshop, and it's located over in what used to be the math room. Uh, this fellowship will fund a student each year to work with faculty and staff to support the operation of that space. So feel free to visit this page on our website and consider applying to some of these fellowships if you are interested. Each one, when you click more information and application instructions, also gives you a contact person if you have questions. And the last thing I want to point out, if any of you are interested, is that the U of I Library is starting a book club. Uh, the first meeting is tomorrow, Wednesday, September 21st at 3.30 p.m. here in the library. Uh, they're going to get together and kind of talk about what they want this book club to be. So if you are looking for an opportunity to connect with other students across campus, consider attending this meeting uh, and learning more. Okay, so back to our presentation. So first, our first tip is to conduct citation chaining. What is citation chaining or searching? This is a strategy where you can use a single source to find related sources. It helps you trace the root of important ideas within your research topic, as well as discover how a topic has changed over time. There are two types of citation chaining. The first is what we call backward citation chaining. A lot of you probably are already doing this. It's looking at your reference list or the lit reviews of the sources you're reading and mining those to find other related sources you might want to examine. You can also pursue what we call forward citation chaining, which is when you start with an original source and you jump forward in how it's been talked about and covered in the research literature. Two resources that help you do forward citation chaining are Web of Science and Google Scholar. The Web of Science is linked to on our library homepage. And from here, what we could do is we could type in a topic if we wanted to, but you can also start with a source name, like the name of an article. And I have a couple of examples here, so I don't have to type them in from scratch. So the first one is optimization of aluminum silicon compounds on fire resistance. If I search for the title of this article, it will find it in Web of Science and tell me that since it was published in 2016, four other articles have cited it. The benefit of jumping forward and seeing who else has used a source that you found helpful is that you can see how ideas and discussions around this topic have grown and expanded and might help you discover new ideas and it will definitely help you discover research you might not have found without having to do any additional searching. So that's just an easy way. You can continue to jump forward by maybe looking at this article, uh, Mesoporous Aluminosilicate and Prismildew Resistance. Maybe you're interested in that too. You can see who else has cited that and continue moving down that chain. 
This function works pretty much the same in Google Scholar, uh, but we're going to try it with a uh, humanities focused article. Nip tucked or sucked belly parton and the construction of the authentic body. So this article uh, is very different and that it's only been cited once since it was published in 2016. It's important to recognize when we're doing forward citation chaining that citation practices are different depending on your discipline and depending on how long it takes research to be published. So you might come across an article like this one published in 2016 that's only been cited once. That doesn't mean it's any more or less relevant than an article that's been cited four times or ten times. Okay, any questions about citation chaining? Okay, so next is to mine author networks. This is helpful because it lets you see not only who is publishing research on a particular topic, but maybe who their co-authors are on these related papers. If you can identify co-authors who are doing similar research, you might be able to expand your own examination of the literature by looking at what they're publishing. Again, two of the top sources for doing this are Web of Science Core Collection and Google Scholar. To do this, we would simply search for the author's name. So in Google Scholar, I'm going to search for let's see, Felix Liao, who is one of our faculty members here. If Dr. Liao or whichever faculty member or author you're looking for has a Google Scholar profile, they will appear. And you can actually see all of their articles, how many times they've been cited in the publication year. But then they will provide information on their co authors. So you could then click on uh, Chow Fan and see what they have published and continue working through. Oftentimes, when researchers work together on their articles, they're starting to do similar research. This might help you discover that research if you're not really sure what keywords to use when you're searching. This works in a very similar way in Web of Science, uh, but they pre present it in more of a, a graphical kind of infographic way. So we'll go to researchers and we'll search by their name. So I'm going to search for Carla Idol. It's going to auto populate the person's last name and then we'll search their first name. One thing to note as I was prepping for this session today is that I had trouble getting this researcher search to work in Google Chrome. Google Chrome tends to cache a lot of the information you searched for previously and can sometimes negatively impact your future searches. Uh, but I was able to get it to work in Firefox. So if you encounter weird issues with our library resources, you can try clearing your cache or trying a different browser uh, and then reporting the problem if it continues. So when I search for an author, it's going to look through Web of Science and try to find someone who matches. So we have a K. Idol, who was at an Institute for Technology in Germany, as well as Carla B. Idol at the University of Idaho. These might be the same person, but we know that Dr. Idol works at the University of Idaho presently. Uh, if I click on her name, I will see all of her publications and time cited, but I can do a little bit more by clicking View as Set of Results. From here, it's just displaying these results in a different way. But once I click Analyze Results, I'll get more of a graphical representation of the subjects in which the idol has published in. And if instead of Web of Science categories, I choose authors, I can see Dr. Idol's co-authors based on the number of times she has worked with them. And then I could click on that person's name, like maybe B.G. Miller and actually view their list of citations and continue to go through that result analysis feature within Web of Science. Again, this, as well as the citation chaining, is just a tip to help you after you've done a bit of searching for your lit reviews, the articles you're publishing, your thesis, or your dissertations, to make sure you're not missing anything by examining who else is doing work in a similar research area. Okay. So next, saving searches and setting alerts. There are a few different ways to save your searches. Uh, most often, you can save a search in a library resource just by grabbing the permalink or whatever URL is in the browser. That will depend on the database uh, because some, like uh, ProQuest and EBSCO, if you choose to save the URL that's up in the search bar, 
that is only good so long as your session remains active, so long as that page is open. Once you've closed it, that URL will not take you back to those search results. So I'll show you where those terminal permalinks tend to be located. Then we'll talk about setting search alerts, citation alerts, and journal alerts, which will notify you um, when new sources that are published related to your search appear in the database, when new citations to a source you choose um, are created or appear, as well as when new volumes and issues of journals are published. So the first place we can do this is within Web of Science. So when you search in Web of Science, I'm just going to go back here and just do a regular search instead of for an article. We will just search for a topic. Web of Science is really easy if you want to save your search. They actually do let you save, and I test it, tested it, the URL up in your search bar. Uh, you can save that and then paste it later, even after you close this session or uh, clear your history and cache. And it will take you back to this list of results, as well as show any new results. But if you actually wanted to be notified when something new is published that meets your search terms, you would click Create Alert and then choose the parameters, how often you want to be emailed, um, whether or not um, you want everything that's published to appear or potentially from just specific journals. Web of Science is a bit restrictive because if you want to create a search alert, a citation alert, or a journal alert, you have to create a free Web of Science account. Uh, you don't have to use your U of I email. You definitely don't have to use your U of I password, but an account is required to set those alerts. Once you set those alerts, you can manage them, like delete them or edit them. You can also set citation alerts because let's say we wanted to know or be notified each time uh, this article, Graphene Offside as Multifunctional Platform, is cited. We would simply click on that article and then say create a citation alert. So this is going to work the same way as that forward citation chaining, but instead of you having to do the searching, it will automate it and tell you when that article is cited. One thing to keep in mind is if you're setting citation alerts, uh, Web of Science is very good for uh, scientific articles, articles in um, the hard sciences, engineering, agricultural sciences, natural resources. It does less well with social sciences and humanities. So if your topic or the articles you're looking at are in those areas, you might want to use a source like Google Scholar or JSTOR to set those alerts. If we go to Google Scholar, again, we can just search for our topic. Like, let's try um, women, superheroes, and stereotypes. I just suggest that I correct my spelling. And then down here, you can actually create an alert for this search. What's great about Google Scholar is you do not have to have a Google account to create an alert. But if you do, it lets you change the alert. Since I'm not signed in, if I create this alert and say, send me an email when new articles are published that meet my search terms or my criteria, all I can do without having an account created is just delete the alert. Creating an account with Google and then creating your alert lets you edit. Uh, what you create. Again, we can do a cited by alert. If we click cited by on any article, we can create an alert to let us know when new articles on that topic are published. Now, one way we can create a journal alert and know when new articles are published in a specific journal in Web of Science is to click on the journal name and then visit its page for the impact factor, which is going to tell us how a journal is ranked in relation to other journals within that same discipline. Once we are on that page, if we're signed in, we can set this as favorites and we will receive an alert when new volumes or issues are published. This is very similar as if you were to go to the actual journal's website and sign up for the alerts there. Okay. Any questions about creating those alerts? Very straightforward. Most databases have that option, including our library catalog. Uh, sometimes you just have to look a little bit to find either those permalinks or uh, the places where you can create the alerts. So now on to a little bit of bonus content. So strategies 
use for planning and organizing a library. What is a literature review? Knowing that this is going to look very different depending on your discipline. But most often, regardless of whether your lit review is a separate section of your article, separate chapter in your thesis or dissertation, or actually embedded within different sections in your work, it's an up-to-date current overview of research on a specific topic. A lit review helps you, you as the author demonstrate that you understand how your research fits within and expands the work that's already been published. It establishes facts or best practices within a body of literature, and it helps you, as well as your readers, identify the gaps in the research and how your work will start to fill those gaps. Determining an appropriate scope for your lit review can be challenging because there's going to be a lot of research potentially out there that you could include. So a few questions you can start asking yourself include how comprehensive does it need to be? Do I need everything? Or is my topic so narrow that I really don't want to include other tangentially related content for this specific article or thesis or dissertation? Will I include all material regardless of the date in which it was published or focus only on a specific time frame? Will you include sources from other related disciplines if the research happens to be interdisciplinary? You might also want to consider, depending on your topic, whether you will include sources written in other languages. Lastly, you can think about when you're trying to determine the scope is how have others in your discipline actually written their own lit reviews. You can figure this out by looking at journal articles by authors in your discipline. But you can also look at theses and, diss theses and dissertations written by former U of I students, maybe who have worked with your major professor. To look at previous U of I theses and dissertations, at least the most recent 10 or 15 years, click databases A to Z on the library homepage. And then we're going to go to dissertations and theses full text PQDT Global. Since about a year and a half ago, all of the theses and dissertations completed at the U of I are only uh, published digitally. If students want a print copy for themselves, they can get that, but they no longer, or College of Graduate Studies uh, in collaboration with the library, no longer print a physical bound copy of the thesis or dissertation for uh, discovery on our shelves. So the most recent ones are available in ProQuest Dissertations and VCs Global, as well as in our catalog, but I like to go here to search directly. There's usually about a 12 to 18 week lag time between when someone's thesis or dissertation gets submitted here and when it actually appears online. Uh, and depending on your discipline, you can choose to have your dissertation or thesis embargoed for a specific period of time to prevent other people from looking at it. If you have data that you might be seeking to publish elsewhere or something you're attempting to patent, um, or even if it is uh, something more humanities focused, if it's a collection of poems, or fiction or nonfiction writing that you're seeking to publish elsewhere, you can put an embargo on your thesis or dissertation. There are a couple of ways to find theses that you might want to look at to figure out how they structure their lit review. You can search by a topic, but I like to go under advanced search and actually search for ones published uh, at the University of Idaho and with students who've worked with specific advisors or committee members. So in the university institution box, I'm just going to type University of Idaho. And then up here in this first box, in the drop down, I'm going to select advisor and then actually look up the advisor. Even though I know the advisor's names that I'm going to do my sample search here, it's important to look them up because sometimes their names appear differently in this type of source than they do on the U of I's website, or maybe by the name that they go with if it's a nickname. So it's going to be last name, comma, first name. So I'm going to search for Jason Carl and choose the two options uh, where his name appears, one with the middle initial and one without, and click Add to Search. And just to make sure that I'm seeing everything that he has worked, all the students he has worked with, I'm going to say or advisor in the first box, committee member in the second box. And when I search, I will see all of the theses and dissertations uh, where Dr. Carl is listed as the advisor or committee member. Oh, 
quickly if the feeds load quickly. Once this loads and we click into an actual example, we can see how a thesis or dissertation is structured within the specific discipline. So I'm going to look at, for this example, uh, Sean DiStefano's dissertation on oil and gas reclamation on U.S. public land. The great thing about dissertations and theses global is that so long as there isn't an embargo on the work, you can access the full text and then download it. So we're going to scroll through and just kind of take a look first at the table of contents to see where we want to go to find the liberty. Now, in this case, we have an introduction. We have some discussion in chapter two about the effectiveness and overview of reclamation. There's probably some literature cited here. But as we get into chapter three and chapter four, we're seeing how a lot of work in the sciences actually incorporates their lit review. They tend to integrate their lit review as a, into the whole work as itself, often in maybe the introduction or method section, uh, using this MRAD structure, introduction, methods, results, and discussion. So if we click on introduction for chapter four, we can see that there's a lot of literature being cited. As we scroll down, potentially into the methods or the objective sections, we can see more literature cited too. So this incorporation of the literature review into the actual maybe body of the text and not separate it out is very different in the sciences than what we see in the humanities and the social sciences, which tend to have separate chapters for their literature reviews or sections if it's an article. So I'm going to go back and show you what that would look like if we were looking at a different type, um, type of source. So I'm going to click modify search, keep University of Idaho, but delete Dr. Carl and look up a different advisor. So I'm going to look at uh, Dr. Sydney Freeman and choose both of those as well, add to the search, and then make sure to paste that in as a committee member. And we'll take a look at Russell Thacker's um, What is uh, Nigentropy, a Manuscript Dissertation. And as we scroll through this and look at the table of contents, we can see it's organized in a very different way. We have introduction, we have a definite lit review, we have methods, and then we kind of have the findings of their work. So depending on the discipline you're in, definitely take a look at other articles or books or book chapters published to see how you can organize and incorporate the literature you're looking at and potentially look at these theses and dissertations to get an idea of how you would structure your own. Any questions on searching in ProQuest dissertations and theses? Okay. So if you still need a few ideas for how to organize your lit review, consider organizing it based on theme, broad to specific, methodology, method or theory, trends based on time or publication date. So even if you're going with a very specific structure, like incorporating your lit review into the introduction or methods or having a separate section, you might want to organize that further. So organizing by theme means you'll organize your lit review around a specific topic, issue, or concept rather than the progression of time. So you'll start grouping together the sources you're using based on larger concepts. So if I was writing a thesis or dissertation on youth substance abuse, uh, use, and prevention, I might have different subheadings like school-based programs, family-based programs, and religious-based programs, and talk about all of the literature that fits within those categories or concepts um, as they appear. Broad to specific functions in a similar way, but you would start with a section on the general type of issue you're covering, then narrow down increasingly to the most specific issue that your work is focused on. So for example, if I was writing about grazing management practices in riparian areas, I might have an initial heading that says, that's looking at the general grazing management practices across all types of areas, not just riparian areas, then I'll have a subsection on facilitating practices in riparian areas, and then narrower sections maybe focused on herding, stock water development, and barrier and fencing practices. So we start broad general practices to be down to the one that I am most interested in, barrier and fencing practices in riparian areas. Next, we have methodology or theory. 
So rather than organizing a lit review based on the content of the sources themselves, you could instead organizing it, organize it around the methods or theory that are used by the researchers doing that original work. So for example, if we were looking at workers' intention to leave their jobs before and after the COVID-19 pandemic, the articles that I found and book chapters and things like that might have, I might be able to group them into three types of research. So those sources where the research was an analysis of economic or labor statistics, those sources that did original surveys of actual workers, and those sources that did interviews with workers. So organizing this type of lit review by the research methods used might be more practical and important for me than organizing by concept generally. Next, we have trends based on time. When you use this structure, you are organizing the work you're citing based on the time period that is relevant to the trend, topic, or issue you are focusing on. The time periods themselves don't inherently represent when the sources were published. This is the time period covered in the work. So if I looked at physical and outfit characteristics of female superheroes and villains, I might have subheadings based on these different periods in time, knowing full well that an article that examined uh, the 1960s portrayal of female superheroes might have been written in 2022. I'm grouping it based on the time period covered in the source rather than when it was published, which gets us to grouping your work by publication date. Within this structure, you'd write about the sources in the order that they were published, maybe grouping them by year chunks or maybe decades. This type of organizational structure tends to work best when you're examining how and whether interpretations or understandings of your topic have changed over time, looking at evolving knowledge and awareness. Organizing a lit review by publication date tends to be uh, much more likely or much more visible in the sciences than in the humanities and the social sciences. But again, be sure to look at work in your discipline and potentially talk to your major professor or co-authors to figure that out if this is a structure you should use. Because one challenge with this type of structure is depending on your topic, it might be challenging to find continuity or create links between the literature you're citing. But somewhere where it could work well is if maybe we were looking at climate change scenarios and guidance. We were looking at the scenarios and guidance provided in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, and 2020s, talking about how it's changed over time, looking at actually how the people who are doing the research were talking about it in those time periods. So any questions about these different ways to potentially organize the lit review? Okay. So the last thing that we're going to talk about is making connections between the sources you find. Uh, if you're already doing a lot of academic writing or have done publishing before, uh, you're likely familiar with this idea of summarizing versus synthesizing. When we summarize, we tend to share the key points from an individual source and then move on and summarize another source. Kind of like if we do an annotated bibliography. We have the citation, then we do the summary. A synthesis asks you to combine the information from multiple sources and add your own analysis of the literature. Most often when we see a lit review, whether it's a separate section in an article or a thesis or dissertation, or embedded within the introduction or the methods, they are often synthesizing the work, talking about multiple sources and making connections between them, rather than having a couple of sentence summaries for each source. There are a few different ways uh, to do this type of synthesis. Linked to on this slide, which you all will have access to, is a post by a doctoral student in special education uh, at the University of North Carolina on how to do a step-by-step -step synthesis. Uh, so according to McNeil, you would have all of the sources in your lit review together, and you would read them several times. The first time you read your source, you're kind of starting to figure out, uh, is this a source I actually want to use? Start skimming for those big ideas. Once you read the source through the second time, you would start to maybe highlight, underline, or, or, or annotate those main ideas that you're seeing in the article. And then that third time is when you're going to start doing the in-depth note-taking. As you're taking notes on every source, 
you'll want to start picking out what main concepts are appearing and how is the author talking about those main concepts. So in this example by McNeil, uh, they were looking at uh, teachers use the subjective ideas and experiences related to using specific interventions in their classrooms. So some of the main concepts they started identifying were teachers use of intervention, contextual influences, training experiences. You start figuring out what those main concepts are, and then you start kind of linking the sources to those. So once you've done this for each article, you'll kind of restart your process and identify what are all of my main concepts and all of my sources and where do they fit. So you'll have your seven or eight main concepts and you'll say, okay, concept one, that is talked about by sources one, two, seven, 10, 12, concept two, et cetera. Then you start to take those main concepts and organize them into the outline based on however you choose to organize your lit review and start incorporating your sources that way at a conceptual level. You could do something very similar. Uh, if you weren't organizing by theme, you could use this synthesis approach for organizing broad to specific by method, trends based on time or publication date. Another option, if you would like to continue to synthesize your sources, is to actually use a synthesis matrix to help you record the main points of each source and then document how they relate to each other. So an example of this, uh, this topic was anxiety in graduate students. Uh, the first row, they have all of the main concepts in these articles that they're focused on, or at least three of the ones. The first column has all of the articles or a subset that they are citing. And then each cell, uh, like the cell for Austin et al. and multiple roles, gives a brief summary of how that specific source talked about that concept of multiple roles. Once you have this filled out, you can start figuring out how do I want to talk about each source and organizing, organize it within my way review. A link to on this slide is an actual matrix template that I created if you all would like to use this. Uh, it is just an uh, Excel, Excel sheet. Uh, the first one, the first page or first sheet, um, includes the main ideas. And then it includes the sources on the left. And then let's see, sheet two includes the sources on the top and the main ideas on the left. So however you feel like doing this, uh, feel free to fill that out. Okay, we are almost done. So when you stop searching, the big question, there's no one size fits all answer. Uh, it's gonna be informed by your topic, your discipline, guidance from your advisor or your journal publisher. But there are a few ways you can start maybe thinking and figuring out if you are getting close. Ask yourself if you've searched within all relevant resources. Have you utilized various search strategies and keywords? Have you tried different combinations of those keywords? Have you achieved saturation? Are you starting to not only see the same sources, but sources that have the same findings repeatedly? Have you found enough sources to justify that your new research is necessary? If you start answering yes to all of these questions and you've consulted with your colleagues, with your professors, with your major professor, that's likely a good indication that you can stop searching for literature and start moving on to that synthesis and analysis portion uh, of your actual paper. So that is all that I have for you all today. I'm happy to answer questions. We have two more graduate student essential workshops this semester, September 27th, supercharging your scholarly presence in three easy steps. And then October 4th, web mapping for every discipline, how to use ArcGIS online. Uh, please consider signing up to attend these or signing up to receive the recording later if you can't make it uh, live in person or live via Zoom. Uh, if you're in person, Conrad has out a short little assessment form. Uh, and then on Zoom, Conrad is going to share or already shared for a link to a Qualtrics survey. Uh, please feel free to fill that out. Uh, and I am here uh, to answer any questions either on Zoom or in person if you all have any. So thank you very much.